Hi everybody and welcome to our free fishing seminars here at Lake of the Ozarks. Uh, I'm John DeParadney, uh, one of the co-hosts of this event and uh, I used to do these seminars at uh, St. Louis County Park on, on fishing Lake of the Ozarks and uh, they discontinued the program so I thought well how about if we try it down here so I teamed up with Bass and Bob and now we have them every week. So uh, what I've done since like 1991 is write fishing articles for different national fishing magazines and websites and uh, during that time I've written two books, this one on the uh, Lake of the Ozarks Fishing Guide, it's available on my website and here at the seminar, uh, $5 here at the seminar and $10 on my website jnoutdoors.com and it basically covers uh, fishing the lake uh, from one dam to the other uh, throughout all the seasons, broken down into the different parts of the lake, the Grand Glaze, the Gravoy, the Osage Arms and, and the Niagara Arm and uh, basically covers bass, crappie, uh, catfish, and white bass. And uh, also has, it just has all the uh, local pros in there and how they catch them and, and four uh, Bassmaster Classic qualifiers that have uh, how they fish the lake. And my other book is uh, one, one Bass Fishing Tips. This is out of New York uh, Publishing Company and it's also available on my website, an autographed copy. And uh, here at the seminar it's $12 and uh, online it's $19.95. So uh, in this one, uh, this is just uh, compiled uh, tips from my stories throughout the years from the various pros, uh, Kevin Van Dam, Edwin Evers, all the guys I've fished with through the years, David Fritz, uh, Guido Hibden, uh, all those guys, and, and their little tips, uh, only like 300 word tips, uh, 101 of them as usual, so <laughs> that's, uh, that's what I got going there. and. Uh, so, like I said, we've had these seminars every week. We only got three left now, and uh, I'll let Bass and Bob talk about what he's got coming up going on. Thanks, John. Appreciate it, buddy. Appreciate you, as always. We have a very special guest I'll introduce here shortly, uh, Harold Stark. We've been trying to get Harold here for five years, and we finally got him sitting on the bench. But in, in the meantime, hey, Joe Walensky, if you're out there looking, I know you, know, you get a kick out of our intros. John's intro, and then I'm like, that mesothelioma kind of commercial. Oh, if you yeah. guys have ever seen that, yeah. get the books, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so get the books, they, they work. <laughs> Thank you, John. Uh, John's awesome. Um, but anyway, so we appreciate everybody here tonight. We appreciate all the viewers uh, watching the uh, seminar here on the video. And a couple, couple of announcements too. One, this coming weekend, Saturday the 18th, we have the Fish for Sight Tournament out of PB2. If you fished the IOUE tournament last weekend, um, you're going to love this tournament. It's substantially similar out of PB2. Got a fish fry uh, with registration on Friday evening, Friday evening uh, the 17th. I'll be there. I'll have some guests. We'll be talking about fishing reports and that type of thing on stage. And then tournament on Saturday the 18th. And then big pork steak dinner, beer, you know, all, all that kind of stuff uh, after the tournament. It's a great tournament, guaranteed $7,500 to the winner. That's pretty darn good, you, you know. Anyway, that, that's a good tournament. So come on out to PB2, check out Fish for Sight. You can get some information on bestmob.com as well as on the Fish for Sight uh, website as well. So hope to see you all. We still have. We still have some openings for the Missouri Invitational Fishing and Golf Championship in November. So check out BassinBob.com. And if you'd like to fish as, uh, as an amateur or you're teamed up with a pro like James Watson or Jeremy Lawyer or Marcus Sakura, uh, check that out. It's three days of fun, rub elbows with some of the best fishermen, not just in the Midwest, but from around the country. So we'd love to see you all there. We have a great time. So let me introduce to you tonight Harold Stark. So Harold has been fishing Lake of the Ozarks for, I, I, if I did the math correctly, it'd be about 40 years. And he has fished his way through Bass Nation quite a bit and has qualified for Bass Nation championships. He's won some Bass Nation tournaments. Uh, he's won some Bass Nation regional tournaments. He won a Bass and Bob uh, Winter Bass Challenge Tournament. Um, he runs, a, what, what, what is the bass club that you run? Uh, actually, I, I don't run one anymore. I started and started and ran three different Eldon clubs and 
Simply Bass. And a couple years ago, I decided not to run any clubs anymore, but I joined the St. Louis area Bass Masters. Uh, just a bunch of guys that like to have fun and wanted to learn. They were a bunch of guys that had fished for years, but nobody would ever talk to them. They were just bass clubbers. So they talked me into joining their club. Yeah. And now we have two-day tournaments once a month, and we sit around and we talk fishing. Oh, wow. And that's the that's the deal. They they are enjoying life again as a bass club. They had went from 60 members down to 11 because they were just burnt out. And we've got them started back up again and moving them in the right direction. And right. having and the whole key is to have fun, right? You know, and that's where I bring it. 40 years of being in different bass clubs, I know what's fun and what's not. So yeah. that uh, we've had we're having a lot of fun doing that. That's awesome, Harold. Well, anyway. We, we, we've tried to get him here for about five years. John was able, finally able, I mean, uh, I mean, his resume speaks for himself, for himself. If you want to put somebody on Lake of the Ozarks with this many years of experience um, and success, you're talking about in the class of the Hibdens, in the class of the Fitzpatricks, in the class of so many others, Marcus Cor, uh, Harold Stark is, is that guy. And we're fortunate to have you. We Thank appreciate you. your taking your time to come. In. So, um, I'll fire some questions at you from behind the camera. But go ahead and let's let's talk about what that bait is. What 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 that not bait, but what that bite is kind of right now as we're in the middle of September, moving through September as we move into October. What what are the kind of things you're thinking about? Well, what we've got right now, uh, September through October and November is the largest transition period on Lake of the Ozarks. The fish are transitioning from a summertime, summertime bite, which we've had a year of current. Current from the 1st of June, and they're still pulling water out of the dam. And what that does, it puts all your major fish in a feeding zone in the deeper water. Uh, that current pulls them out there. That's getting ready to stop. Uh, they're slowing down. The lakes are the lakes are going into their winter stuff. We haven't had any rain to speak of for three months. You know, everywhere around. So the fish are going to go into the largest transition that they have in a year's time. From now until the water completely hits its bottom, uh, the fish are going to be on the move. They're going to do one thing. Hits going its to, bottom in terms of uh, temperature. It hits its lowest in terms of in, temperature. In, in, in temperature. It'll hit it'll hit its bottom in. February generally or January or February, it'll hit that 36 to 39 degrees. Right. All right. From right now till then, it's going to constantly be slowly dropping. And the fish, with the, they transition just like any other wild creature. Daylight hours means a lot, may mean more than, than the water temperature. But their food is temperature oriented. So the shad have already started moving to the backs of the coves. They've been there for two or three weeks in some places. Uh, you know, the different sizes, you got to remember you've got two or three different year classes of shad in a lake. And the different sizes are going to group together. Your bigger fish are going to follow the bigger shad. It's just that simple. Uh, smaller fish are going to follow the ones that they can catch the easiest, which is the smaller shad. And that transition happens so gradual that we, we think that it, that it may, it, it hasn't happened, it'll happen and it, we say it happens gradually, but it, it can happen overnight. You know, it just depends on where the food goes. And so the biggest deal now is to, for me, I, and I, I'll just speak for myself, I can't speak for everybody because everybody does things differently. For me, this time of year, it's all about following, trying to follow the fish and using moving baits to keep up with them. Uh, you take uh, any given day on my boat, I'll have eight rods laid out on the day. <laughs> and uh, this time of the year, it sounds like me. You know, th <laughs> this time of the year, I'll have I'll have uh, one side will be horizontal moving baits, the other side will be baits that I fish on the bottom, and you know, and in that respect, I'll I'll cover the I'll cover the water column from the top to 35, even 40 feet, because the transition and and this time of the year, the water the water oxygen. Is the same from the top to the bottom because we have we've had the we've had the current all year. There's there's no there's no thermocline to speak of. Now once we get to a 
once we get to a point where the water temperature is cooler on top, we start having turnover. Well, turnover is a pretty constant thing. Uh, once, once they quit pulling the current, your colder water at the top is always going to sink. And so you've got, a, you've got some sort of turnover, and everybody hates that. They, they think it affects the fish. Well, it doesn't affect the fish as much as it affects the bait, which, you know, then that affects the fish. The fish are still going to eat. They don't, they don't care. So I have found, for me, uh, fishing a moving horizontal lure and covering tons of water is what I base, base my tournament parts on. I don't go looking for big schools of fish. I just drop the Lorance in the water, kick that dude on five, and step on the troll one. So in that, let me get you some of my horizontal baits that I use this time of year. And I'll use these all the way up through November because uh, that, that uh, it just seems to work. And of course, everybody throws it. Just you, you start with your basic square bill. Uh, this thing can bounce off of rocks, cover, uh, resemble shad. They come in all kinds of sizes. Everybody likes to throw a 1.5 or a 2.5. They make 3.5s, you know, the, that, all the way up to four inches, depending on the size of the shad you're able to find. If you can match that size of shad and cover the water, you're gonna catch some fish. The, the biggest key to this is to find a brand that you're comfortable with. I'm not gonna tell you to go out and buy one of them $50 handmade balsas. You can, if you're comfortable with that, go ahead and do it. You don't mind banging it in the rock and breaking yeah. yeah. <laughs> the nose. What I do, I go, I buy what I feel is a good bait. It's relatively inexpensive and I can change the colors. I can go get me a crank wrap off the shelf, buy a crank wrap, put on, make it whatever color I want. Yeah. Uh, this is a Storm Arashi. This is a, uh, a 2.5 size bait. And I throw, I found, uh, matter of fact, what got me started throwing them is I found them in a bargain bin for a buck ninety nine and I bought eight or nine of them just to try out and man they are a good bait they do the job they get it they run straight they run well you don't lose as many fish on them. the biggest key for me to throw in a square bill is this rod here it's almost as old as my daughter <laughs> how, um, how old is your daughter she's 23 <laughs> awesome and Congratulations. this is a, a uh, St. Croix uh, e-glass rod it's got a perfect parabolic mean. Uh, I used to have two of them, I'm down to one. I'm gonna have to find some more because they do wear out. Uh, but when, you, when you, you don't set the hook with one of these baits, you crank fast and just pull into it whenever it gets on it. Because if you start jerking on one, the treble hooks, I don't care how big a treble hook you got, what brand of treble hook you use, you're gonna pull it out of his mouth. Let the fish get a hold of it, let him pull on it. And then you pull back and just get him in the boat. Uh, I see a lot of guys, one of my biggest pet peeves when I was teaching people how to fish, they would catch a fish on a square bill or a crankbait, and the first thing they do is they'd stick their rod in the water to keep the fish from jumping. The minute you do that, you lose control of the fish. Pull on the rod, pull the rod sideways, and put pressure against the fish, and keep pressure against the fish. Let him, if he wants to jump, when he jumps, just pull on him a little bit. Keep pressure on him. Don't let him, don't let him get the slack in there. Keep, keep cranking, and you're, you'll land 90% more than you will if you stick that rod in the water. And if you stick the rod in the water, you lose control of what's happening. Uh, that's what, one of my better what, And what kind of reel and this speed is, reel and what, now, kind of, what kind of line do you like? I'm going to tell you what. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's another key. that uh, I throw monofilament line whenever I throw a horizontal bait. Uh, 90 percent of the time. Sometimes in the in the springtime or in the middle of winter, I'll go to a floor carbon line just to get it a little bit deeper. But I like the stretch of the monofilament. I throw big game. I throw 15 and 20 when I'm throwing a square bill. Uh, if I'm fishing the rocks and I need to get a little deeper, I'll throw 15. But if I'm covering any kind of wood uh, or any kind of heavy, like if I'm throwing at boat docks and I'm throwing it into the wells, bring across those girders underneath the openings. Mm -hmm. I want 20. And let me tell you, that's a deal for the square bill. People don't, people don't do that, but if you, you find a stretch of empty boat docks with the wind blowing in on and the shad out in front of the docks, you crank a square bill across those girders that the supports on right. the open wheels, you can get right in the hurry. 
Uh, they they use that just as, just because it's a vertical or a horizontal piece of stuff in the water. This time you're the fish voice looking for something horizontal, something they can get on, they can lay up against it, they can they can just kind of in their it makes a shadow, and anything that makes a shadow, then fish feel secure in, so they can look out there into the open and see the prey. Yeah. They don't necessarily hide from the light. Uh, a large mouth in a Kentucky or black bass, they're members of the sunfish family. Sunlight does not. <coughs> The only the reason they use the shade is they use it like a big cat. They use it to hunt, and that's and that's what you want. That's what you want. You want if you know there's shade there, there's a bass can be using it for for his ambush. But that's what uh, this is a Revo S reel. I use any kind of reel in a six four. Uh, I don't use real fast reels. I don't use the sevens. I don't use the the, the higher gear ratios because I think you can overwork these baits. Uh, that's the and for me, a guy like me, when I've got the trolling motor on five, I'm cranking. So sometimes I have to slow myself down. I'll go to a little slower reel to slow down. But especially if you start catching fish and then all of a sudden you quit catching them, stop and look at what you're, how you're presenting the bait because you may be over cranking it. You get excited. We all do. Even after all these years of catching fish, you, you catch two or three in a row and you, you're trying to catch another five pounder to win that tournament. <laughs> you get a little excited. So check and make sure, stop yourself, slow down and uh, fish that root, fish that but Harold um, so in this you know this I'll call it this time of year uh, throwing that square bill you know if I want to bait fish and all that are you fishing you, you mentioned wood you mentioned docks um, is there any kind of depth you're looking well, for or the, any, the, the no biggest areas of the lake and that type of thing the, the biggest thing that I look for this time of year because they are in transition uh, and I put my trolling motor down they could be from the front of the coal to the back of the coal. It all depends on the size of the shad that you're looking at. Uh, and you got to, the, because the fish are, they're moving. They're moving from out here where they've been set up in groups of 100 fish on those drop offs right. or the brush piles. And one by one, they start heading in. They start moving back. They start looking for that fall feed to where they can gorge their cells without the competition. They've been out here fighting with the other fish all summer long. And in the fall year, I very rarely will catch three off of one dock. Right. Uh, I mean, it happens. I'm not going to lie. It, it does. The, the fish are like people. We, sometimes they get bunched up. Some, most of the time in the fall, you're looking for that individual fish on that individual piece of cover. Uh, lay downs, any kind of lay down that you can visually see. And then it tapers off into something you don't. Uh, any kind of any kind of lay down that has a deep side to it and a shallow side. When I go up into a creek, like yesterday, I was in the gravels. I went up to the big gravel was just to get away from the boat traffic. I've got one log. I was telling John, I've got one log up there that every September I can go up there, and either with uh, man's minus one or square bill or a ten inch worm, I'm going to catch a four and a half pounder off of it. <laughs> And it, what it, the secret to that log is, it's the only log on that flat that I can find that has two foot of water on one side of it, and this log's a 20 foot long log, it's got four foot of water on the other side of it. Yeah, there's one fish will live there, I can go up there in September before everybody gets out and goes, and I did yesterday. I went up there and I fished it with the, the minus one first, and then I fished it with the square bill, and I picked up that worm and first cast the worm, I catch a corn that time. It, but when you can find in a, a tournament person, you can find five of those in the one day and you know you're going to get them, right. you're just ready to go. But it doesn't happen because there's everybody fishes and everybody knows them things that they can find that fish and catch them. But that's, what, that's the thing you look for. You look for that oddity, the little difference in the depth on one piece of cover. Uh, whenever I'm fishing uh, docks and stuff, I look for the wind. Doesn't have to be deep docks, don't have to be shallow docks. In the fall of the year, the wind is your friend. You can go down, you can have docks in 30 foot of water. The fish in the wind are gonna they're gonna be up because the shad are up. The shad aren't on the bottom, they're up, they're moving too. And you look for how the shad are set up on the docks. You can throw the crankbait, you can parallel the side of the dock, you can parallel the front of it. You know, you can throw in it, whatever it's once you find that day, that particular day, because every day is different. One, on that particular day, if, you, if they're all on 25 foot deep docks, that's what you, if you catch the first four pounder off a 25 foot deep dock, you better be looking for more of them like that 
in similar places and similar codes, or even in the same code you're in. Uh, you know, if you go, if you fish in practice and you fish the whole cove out, and the only bites you had were in the middle of the cove, in the backs of the pockets, in five feet, you know, they're going to stay there for that right. couple of days. That's where they're at. And then you pick accordingly, you choose the lure and technique that it takes to catch it. Like I say, that transition, you know, because two days later, they're going to be gone. <laughs> they're going to be moving again. They're, they are on there, they're on the move. You don't see the real fat, heady, solid fish that, that has lived in some place where he's going to stay there all summer or all fall. He's going to be moving. They're long, they're thin, and they're looking to feed up. They won't get fat until the end of October or November when it starts cooling down. And they can sit in one spot for the rest of the winter. You know. Good stuff. Uh, Good. You know, another technique that this time of year, that square bill, uh, a version of the square bill, man minus one. Uh, I was going to do this whole thing on the minus one the other day, but then I seen where a professional was doing a YouTube on it the other day, and I thought, ah, they're going to think I'm just following <laughs> up on him, but I can't help it. Yeah. I have to go ahead and do it. You got, you got 40 years. We'll, we'll, use, we'll go ahead and take your 40 years I versus use the, the YouTube video. <laughs> I, use, I use these. I use the big minus one and, and the mid minus. Uh, this one I've taken apart. I'm getting ready to clean it up, and it's getting ready to get a little paint job on it. Uh, that bait right there, that is a bait that you have, don't have to have any cover for. That is when you're practicing, you can take that bait and chunk and wind it all day long and find out where they're at. This is, this is the kind of bait, it doesn't, it'll, it'll hang up because it doesn't have that big square bill on it. Right. You, you want to be careful around the lay downs. You can still bump a lay down with it, it's got a wide enough body to get loose, but you may have to go get it a few times during the day. There's nothing wrong with that. Guys, don't let getting hung up frustrate you, uh, because I do it uh, all day long. I, yesterday, <laughs> I went and got I went and got one about a dozen times, but you got to be careful now because you can't get out on the docks like we used to. Right. <laughs> but that uh, these are baits here that you can chunk and just crank back. Uh, they don't have to bump off anything to get a bite. They're really thin body. They've got a big rattle. They'll attract them when the fish are feeding. They'll attract them from a long, long ways. Uh, I've used it for years on Lady Ozarks without telling anybody uh, because we always used it up the trim. We've used it up there for years when I fished the Red Man and BFLs many moons ago. Uh, this was one of our prime baits up there. Uh, one of the colors, two of the colors I use, I use this, uh, which is Ghost, and then I paint them uh, eggshell white with red eyes. The only two colors I use. Uh, this color here, I throwed it yesterday just to get it broke in. I like to throw them and get them broke in before I ever paint them. If you throw them a few days, they'll actually, the insides will get thinner and they'll get louder. And you want to do that before you paint it. Because once you paint it, uh, it gets a little thick. It's not nearly as loud. So I'll take and throw one. I'll throw one. I'll save them for, throw them for a year before and save them and then paint them after that to keep the loudness. Wow. Uh, that's you got That's one of the things I noticed the first time I did one of these eggshell white. It was a brand new one out of the deal, and I couldn't get no bites. The guy in the back of my boat was kicking my tail, and I grabbed his bait to listen to it and shook it, and his was twice as loud as mine. Mm -hmm. Come to find out, it was older. And that, then is the that first, because of rattles inside? There are rattles inside of it. Yeah, those rattles will actually wear on that thin wall, and it'll make it louder as, as the older it gets. If you ever break one of these, which I broke a bunch of them on boat docks, they're real thin, and you can see how the how they react inside. So I know that one of the things is always breaking. It's like a good buzz bait. Uh, you want to break that in before you've ever tied on it, or never tie a new buzz bait on a tournament. <laughs> always, always break them in and put them aside for tournaments. And then once they're broke in, then they never get thrown except in a tournament, right? Because the blades are going to break off at the end of the day. Uh, that's another bait that you can use this time of year. I'm all about putting that trolling motor down and running, just going as hard as I can, covering a lot of water. Uh, I don't have the, the electronic skills that a lot of our younger anglers today right. have to find those fish on their deal, just run to them. But you still win. But I still win. <laughs> there's, 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 ways that, there's ways that you can do this, and that's, that's, you know, everybody, you should never feel like you can't win. I, it doesn't matter what kind of boat you've got, what kind of electronics you've got, how much money you've got. When you go fish a tournament, if you go fish to win, put that in your mindset and do 
what you're able to do, you still catch five keepers that weigh 20 pounds like everybody else does if you go out and do it. Harold, in our old, that's one in our old bass club, I remember in our early years you had that little, uh, what did you have, about a 40 hearts? Yep. On that 60 had a, footer. Had a low big John. All the time. Had a low big John with a 40 on it. <laughs> and I would put three six gallon gas tanks in the back of that boat and would take off from PB2 and run to the 55 mile marker in a 40, <laughs> horse, 40 horsepower aluminum boat. And I would get up there and fish for uh, three hours, maybe, and then run back to PB2 wow. with the winning fit, winning sacks in the boat. Uh, the uh, It's all in your mindset. It's all how you do it. Uh, you go out there and try to do the best you can. Now, the one thing I can tell anybody, uh, experiment. I did something yesterday that I've done for a few years, but I had I was having to make these lures myself, and they're hard to make. But on vacation last month, down on the salt water, we went to Florida, I found some stuff that I had been making by hand. Well, down there, it's a natural deal. They use them for redfish. And it's a beetle spin type lure, type safety spin, that we have always, we've made them our own. It's a small profile bait we throw in the, this time of year, we throw under the wads of shad. And believe it or not, that bait will skip under a boat dock as well as a jig. Wow. Because of the head design and the flexibility, because it swings on the arm, you can skip that under a, under a boat dock just like you can skip a jig. So it's you've got to experiment. If you see something, think about it. Uh, this is going to go into my repertoire because there's nothing I like better than skipping a jig under a boat dock. Uh, that, uh, and this is going to add to it because there's times everybody and their brothers get the jig under a boat dock, you've got to do something a little bit different. And so never ever be afraid to experiment. Uh, go out there and do what you like to do and then add to it. Take what you learn from everybody else and just stick it in the back of your head, back of your pocket. Do your best. That's what uh, I try to do with our bass clubs. Uh, we try to get young guys in there. I'm mentoring a couple of high school kids right now. Awesome. And they're having the blast. They're having the time in their life. And I've got them. One of them went out the other day and bought an eight-foot flipping stick because that's what I use when I'm flipping. Is that I've what got, you use with that, I, with that well, bait? With this, with this bait, I'm using a 610. Uh, it's, this is actually a Lonnie Stanley jig rod. It's another rod that's as old as my daughter. <laughs> uh, it's the last one I got. Uh, I, I had 10 at one time. Apparently you told me before you had a daughter you could buy all these rods. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that uh, my one and only sponsor many years ago was All Star Rods. Uh, when it was owned by the people in Texas. And they made a great, great rod. I love the big eyes. I'm not a big fan of the small eye rods that they make today. I like the big eyes. Mm -hmm. And this rod here is a 610 jig rod. And you can do... This, I can skip a finesse jig with it, but I like it for my horizontal presentation. It's got an almost parabolic bend to it, which that, when I'm doing a horizontal presentation, I want I want the whole rod to bend. Yeah. Uh, I, I, well, for that matter, I, even with my flipping sticks, I've got two eight-foot castaways that bend right in the middle when I set the hook. Uh, I'm getting older, don't have the strength that I used to have. The one thing about it, when you set the hook on a flipping stick and a fish because he's really close, you know, he's right there, he's 10 foot away, 15 foot. You set the hook on him and he jumps. If you've got a real fast tip rod, when he jumps, what's your rod going to do? It's going to go straight. Right. As soon as it goes straight, you've got slack, he can spit it out. You've got a parabolic bend when he jumps, your rod's still got plenty of bend in it. It's going to keep the line tight. So I prefer a parabolic bend for my style of fishing. Yeah. Those guys that can really crank fast and do the other things, they can keep them on those, those fast action rods. But, that's just not my style. So, so you, that's the other thing. Find your style. Find the way you like to fish. And so, so Harold, on, on that particular bait, when you're skipping that under docks, you know, a lot of us do, like you said, skip jigs and shaky heads and all this yeah. kind of stuff underneath there. When you're skipping that, that that's looking beautiful. Are you letting it like hit the bottom when will they bite it on the fall, or are you just when, when I getting when it I, in there and start starting to reel it slow right away? What 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 I do most of the time until I get a bite, I experiment. Uh, I'll uh, I'll make five or six casts, 
straight in and crank it straight out, uh, just under the thumb. Uh, you know, then I'll do. You get stuck on one thing, you'll get into a motion where you you're going down a row of docks and you'll be skipping in there and cranking it right back out. You've got to be thinking all the time, uh, and I'm I'm the world's worst about that. I'll get I'll get to thinking about the next cast down and I'm skipping it in there and cranking it out. You got to you got to really when you're skipping, you got to pay attention to every cast. Uh, you can't be thinking about the next one. You gotta, you gotta make, make the until you know what they want to do. You gotta uh, fish. You gotta get out there and actually fish, right? And use your head to do it. Once you make that determination, what they're biting. Once you get those first two or three bites, then you can start thinking ahead and doing what needs to be done. That that makes you a, a better angler. That's what gives you an edge to catch three pounders and not two and a half. And we all know that three to three and a half pound fish are gonna get you checked. Right. Uh, five three and a half pounders is eighteen pounds. <laughs> well, everybody, everybody wants four pounders or five pounders. Hey guys, I'll take five three and a half pounders every time yeah. uh, to start with. That just makes me just take them with that. Harold, tell uh, tell us. Yeah, I'm, I'm mostly interested, in, so I, I think my best and Bob members will be too. That particular bait is that a custom made bait? No, nope. tell, tell us is, a little bit is, about this that. Is actually, that looks filthy, dude. This is actually an Elastec bait. They sell them down there on the coast for redfish. Is that the uh, Z-Man bait? Z-Man, yeah, yeah Z-Man. Yeah, it's uh, Z-Man. makes this head, and it comes in the ones that I've seen comes in eight, three sixteenths, and quarter. Now, when I'm throwing in the fall, I like the smaller baits. I like the eighth ounce and the three sixteenths. This is a three sixteenths. Uh, you can actually shorten this bait up. Uh, to be perfectly honest, on a really tough day like yesterday was, yeah. Here, take the tail off. That makes it the old beetle spin. Huh. Gosh, how many fish as kids mm-hmm. did we catch on a beetle spin? Yeah. Uh, they want something soft. They want it small. They want you know. Once that goes in front of their face, they're not going to pass it up. You know, when they're real aggressive. And you're looking for bigger fish, keep her on there. If you're not getting any bites, cut that tail off. Or put on a fluke. Put on a small fluke. Not the big ones, but the smaller bait. And, and let that, and just kind of let that, uh, you, that, it's that, got sm- a, that small uh, um, like spinner. Yep, that small blade will thump. It thumps, it thumps like, a big, like a big Colorado on a, on a nice. one ounce bait. It, it really, it's got good thump. And if you let it fall, when you pitch it in there and you give it a twitch and it starts falling, it's going to spin the whole time. It spins while it falls. Now, because it's flexible, uh, it's not real super uh, weedless, but when you're skipping around the dock, it doesn't have to be. Right. Uh, you want the thump and you want it, and once they get a hold of it, you don't lose many fish. <laughs> it's wow. got enough flexibility that it doesn't, doesn't pull it out of their mouth. So. And, and what size line, Harold? 20. Uh, whenever I'm skipping, I don't skip anything less than 20. Uh, that uh, star foam, which we don't have anymore, but the black boxes right. are heck on your line. Uh, every time you touch one of them, you're actually putting, you know, it looks smooth and whatnot, but your line is going to get nicked. Uh, I throw 20 and I retie every 30 minutes or after every keeper, whichever comes first. Because whenever you're making that skip, you're putting a lot of pressure on your knot. You're making that hard, any kind of a, a cast like that puts pressure on your knots. And I use, uh, I use a simple knot, I use the uni knot. I uh, have for many, many, many years. It's fast, it's efficient, and because I really tie a lot, I don't have any problems with it. Yeah. Uh, I don't, uh, I use it for whatever, any, any lure, any technique. Uh, Sometimes with a jig, I'll tie a loop knot if I'm fishing deep. But this time of year, because I'm on the move and stuff, even with even with a jig, I'm tying a uni knot to it. Right. Uh, you just use the gold blade, or you use some silver blades too? I, I throw gold on everything. Uh, I the silver. I don't I don't know that the color makes that much difference. But the one thing that that I do do is uh, the shorter you get this time of year, the more stained the water is because basically the boat traffic. Uh, You've got the algae blooms and the turnover and boat traffic, so the shallower the water is, is generally a little dirty. Yeah. So I always I just throw gold on about everything that I've got. And is that color swim bait that you have on that that 
Now, is that is that bait actually come with that swim bait, no. or is that a swim no, bait that is, you add to it? This is swim bait that I add to it. Uh, it comes uh, uh, with just the head, the, just the head and the hook and the, and the blade. Right, is how it's packaged from uh, last day. And this is a uh, Strike King swimmer. Uh, you can use the, like say, you can use the small flukes. Right. Uh, you can use the swimmers. Uh, any of your salt plastics that you like. Uh, I tell you what, a zoom, uh, a zoom Z crawl. Yeah. Would be good on the back of this. Yeah. It skips great, and would give you. It would actually slow it down. You can do whatever you want. Experiment with it. I love the zoom Z crawl. I'm a. I like. I'm not sponsored by zoom, but I. I'm gonna tell you what, that bait can be used for anything. Jig trailers, it can be flip by itself, it can be used on spinner bait, chatter bait. Uh, this is my new chatter bait, I think. Uh, yeah. Because I've been throwing chatter bait without letting anybody know for a long time in the fall. They're great. Uh, any, any, anything that you can skip underneath that boat dock that other people don't throw, right? Uh, we'll get you a few more bites. Yeah. And but this is this is something that I think has become or should. We used to do it for years. We'd make our own and go up the river and throw it underneath the <laughs> throw it underneath the, the shad schools up there. Yeah. And this is I got yesterday. Got out there and was got to experimenting with how well it skipped, and I was totally impressed because that, that head just lets it go, and it would it would actually just like a jig would underneath it. So Harold, um, when it comes to like the fluke or that that swim bait that you have on there now. Are there any times where you will kind of experiment with the different colors as well? Well, I'm or, a, or is there something in particular like I'm doing this 80% of the time, and then I every like now and then I'll change this up. 80% of the time I'm throwing straight white. Uh, I have this uh, thing about color. Uh, I think sometimes we think too much about it. Uh, straight white gets more bites in the winter, summer, spring, and fall. In a moving horizontal bait than any other color out there. It's simple. The fish, it's not obtrusive. Uh, now, I'll add some sparkle in the sunshine. Uh, you know, you get a you get a real bright sunshiny day and, and uh, might get you an extra bite. So, you know, I keep some of those, it, just any kind of a shad pattern depending on what you've got. Uh, and most of that is a pure confidence. Too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, a few compliments. I yesterday because I was experimenting, I didn't put a white one on there because I've only got so many. Of them. <laughs> I put the I put that one on there just because uh, I had five of them and I was experimenting with it. We well, you know, uh, want to tear them up. I saved my white ones for tournament day. <laughs> I can guarantee you that tomorrow morning if I was getting in a tournament, it would probably have a white one on it. Uh, that's that's just the way it is. The you know when I throw a buzz bait, I throw two colors. I throw black and I throw white. Uh, you know, I may change the color of the blade a little bit. I'll throw a black blade or a, a gold blade or a white painted blade, but that's about it. You know, when I throw a spinner bait, it's all white, all chartreuse, or it's all black. Uh, you know, that's uh, I, I try to I try to keep my fishing as simple right. as possible. You know, I've got three boxes in the boat that probably weigh 50 pounds with different jigs in it. But you find yourself every day when you go to tie on a brand new jig, or three jigs like I do, you've got three on, you've got a black and blue one, you've got a brown one, and you've got a crawdad green one on. Right. <laughs> right. That's, that's, what you're, that's what you're throwing, you know. Right. You, and, uh, same way with the worm? Same way you with plastic. the worm very much? When I, when I, uh, we were going to talk about a Cinco tonight, and then I caught up with that. I throw uh, two colors of Cinco's. I throw a green pumpkin, I throw black and blue. Uh, Cinco is another bait that you can throw this time of year. Once you've found those fish, then all of a sudden they quit biting. You can't find them anywhere. You pick that rod up with the Cinco on it and a quarter ounce sinker. And I don't throw a shaky yet. Uh, it's just me. I throw a Texas rig uh, all the time. Uh, I don't know if I've even got a shaky head in the boat. But I experiment with different sizes of sinkers. And I throw a Texas rig sinko with a quarter ounce sinker and a three dot J hook 90% of the time whenever I throw a sinko. The other the other percentage of the time I throw it, I throw it weightless. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you can catch uh, a sinko will catch you fish this time of year because one, it's obtrusive, uh, unobtrusive. It, it bothers nothing. 
when it goes down and starts sinking, there's nothing going to get out of its way because it's gentle and soft. And it will catch a big fish. It will get a big bite, little bite. If anything that swims will bite it. You can peg it and skip it. You can fish it in 20 foot of water and brush salt. It's one of those baits that you just got to keep on and throw. Uh, I haven't got to fish much this summer, but I probably, a month ago, we got to go up the river below Truman Dam. I had back to back 17 pound days in current. Uh, and they were all caught on Cinco with a quarter ounce sinker. Wow. Uh, you know, that uh, it's something when you when you don't get a chance to practice and you want to get a bite, tie that, you can tie a Cinco on it, I guarantee you, you're going to get a bite. And if you put something together, it's going to catch just as many keeper size and tournament size fish as anything else. And did you say a quarter ounce sinker or did you say quarter you ounce, of play Believe it or not, with that a little bit? I, don't, I don't play with it. I throw quarter ounce black lead sinker. Black. Uh, I don't throw the uh, tungstens. They're too loud. Whenever I'm throwing a sinko, I want it to be as uh, subtle as it can be. Uh, a tungsten sinker, the minute it hits the bottom, it makes a noise. Uh, I, if I'm making a noise, I've got something else out there. Right. Uh, I want that Cinco to be as soft and as gentle as possible. And are you, peg, are you pegging it, Texas? I, what I do, I put a peg on my line. 90% of the time, I run the peg about a foot up above the sinker so that it can slide. And then when I get in the spot where I have to skip it, just slide it like down there, that. skip it, do your thing. But when I'm fishing in a brush pile, I want that sinker to separate. Right. I want it, once the it, sinker hit the bottom, then here comes the sinkhole falling down behind it. Right. Uh, just makes, for me, it's, it's the, all in the presentation and how it, how it falls. Because a sinkhole basically represents a bottom minnow, something that's swimming on the bottom. Well, if you, as a kid growing up in the creek, every minnow that I've seen, none of them ever had their head sticking down on the bottom. Right. They were following the bottom, they were as horizontal as be, and I want that bait to be as horizontal. When I'm fishing it in a foot of water, it's horizontal. It's going to, you skip it underneath there and go back to that floater, skip it underneath there, it's going to fall and go, it's already horizontal. When you move it, I don't jump it, I lift the rod and just barely move it. I want it to be horizontal with the bait. I want it to move subtle and natural. Nice. And I believe that's what draws the bites for me. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, like I say, everybody's different. There's, there are tons. I've got friends that they make a living on a Cinco on other lakes for shaking it. Hmm. They, they don't even own it piece of lead to put on the Texas tree. Yeah. They throw it on and they catch fish on it. And everybody else can too. It's just not my style. Right. What size line you like on that Cinco here? Twelve to fifteen uh, on the Cinco. Uh, I use uh, red label Seaguar. Uh, I can buy it and change it because I change my I have to change my line a lot. Of course as you get older your thumb doesn't work as much so you get some cancer stuff in there. <laughs> so I change it fairly often. Uh, it does a good job for me. I use a seven and a half foot medium heavy blues flipping stick with that sinker, even with 12 pound line uh, because it allows I can skip it it's got a fairly parabolic mirror uh, I can skip it or I can cast it a country mile with whatever I need to do with it so I keep one rod rigged with that at all times I do use a 7 to 1 gear ratio reel with it because a lot of times you'll skip that thing into that shallow platform in there and they'll take off they'll run like it's called today in front of the dock you yeah. got to you got to get a hold of them and, and set the hook. Yeah. So, but so I do keep a, a fast reel on that, and I use the Abu Garcia Revo SX, or I use the Lose Super Duty, whichever one I happen to have on the rod at the time. I love that Lose Super Duty. I've had, I'm not sponsored by them, but I've had three of them since 2016, and they are still as smooth today as they were the day I bought them. Same way with the Revo SX. They're both they're they're great reels for that. Uh, you know, that's the other deal. We buy, we see the advertisements for $300 reels all the time. Right. And a $150 reel, like the Revo SX and the, and the Lou Super Duty, will do just as good a job. Guys, if you keep them clean, take, them, take the sides off of them, clean them up, keep them clean, keep them oiled. They'll last forever and they're great. They're great products. Buy that. Buy the best you can afford. Don't overdo yourself. You want to be able to fish and put gas in them. Yeah. So do what you can. That's that's the one of the one of the things. That's why I still got rods that are 
20 plus years old, and, I, you, uh, and they still work, so you still use them. Yeah. Harold, uh, you know, um, I've known you for several years now. I've always been very impressed by you, and uh, you're such not, not just a great angler, but you're such a good character person, uh, which is coming through big time on this video. We appreciate you sharing that information. I think about when I think about you. I think about shallow. Is that is that you or is 90, that, and is, 90, or is there something? Ninety percent of the time, ninety percent of the time, I've got to lift my trolling motor up on the front of <laughs> There. Uh, now, that being said, that being said, I love June, July, and Lake Yeah. I'll get out there and ride the wave and fish. I've, uh, I've caught fish as deep as 52 feet on Lake Eosars. Wow. Wow. In 1995, I fished a Red Man Regional on the Mississippi River. And I met a, a guy from Texas. And we were out, neither one of us were any fish. We were sitting out in the middle of this pond off the Mississippi River talking. And he seen I was from Missouri. And he said, "Hey, have you got any of them Aikens jigs?" He said, "I see you're from Missouri. Are you from one of the Ozark Lakes?" And I said, "Well, yeah, I've got a whole box of them." He said, "What would you take for some of them?" And I said, "Well, what do you got?" <laughs> and he, I said, "What kind of jigs have you got?" He said, "Well, I'm from Sam River." He said, "I've got all these here grass jigs." I said, "Let me look at this." We swapped boxes that day. He had a box full of ounce and a quarter grass jigs. And I gave him a box of acre jigs, five sixteen ounce finesse jigs. And I brought that home. And my brother was just starting to fish at the time, and he looked at him and he said, what do you need explicitly are we going to do with those? And I said, Daniel, we're going to go out and we're going to, we're going to go check these out. We're going to check this out. So on a Thursday night tournament, Thursday night Jack Potter down here, we went out. And we run to the mouth of Buck Creek. Daniel had been catching fish on the Carolina rig out there. And I tie this ounce and a quarter grass jig on to my best flipping stick with 20 pound at the time I swung on the filament. And we set up on that spot, and you can see on the graph, they were down there about 33 feet. And I pitched that thing out there and jerked it up off the bottom and got the rod almost jerked out of my hand. <laughs> And we come in that night with 26 pounds, five oh, fish on a third night. 26 pounds. And second place, second place had like 13 pounds. Wow. And I told him. That was a three hour tournament. That was a three hour tournament. Yeah. And I told Daniel, I told, I told him, I said, Daniel, don't say a word <laughs> about this jig. <laughs> anybody. So for four nights, in, four Thursday nights in a row, we just, we jacked them. Everywhere we went, we threw that big jig. And then lo and behold, that fall, somebody on a pro circuit wins the tournament throwing a football head in one ounce. <laughs> and the next spring, they were one ounce of jeans <laughs> But we had a blast. That's the whole deal, is, yeah. is learning to have fun and experiment, not being afraid, right. not being afraid to try something. Right. And of course, when, those, when I showed that to the guys in, uh, they quit running water that summer, and I showed it to the guys uh, on the Thursday night of space. They looked at me and said, you're lying. <laughs> there ain't no way you're lying. Yeah. And it didn't end. Well, by the next spring, yeah, it all got out. So, And even to this day, the guys in the bass clubs, why, why I probably went through so many bass clubs, everybody in, in the original Elden Bass Club still thinks to this day, every time I catch fish, it's on the G. <laughs> uh, but, and it's not all the time. Right. So I love to throw horizontal, and I love to do whatever it takes to get a bite. So in the uh, in, in the fall, and I I, I understand that yeah. totally in the uh, June and July, and I appreciate you sharing that story. That's awesome. Um, how shallow will you will you start deep it start fishing? Will you will you start believe it like, or not? Wait wait wait, or kind of fish mid to the back of creeks or you know side pockets and stuff like that, or you know fish river areas. I mean, when kind of when do you feel like? that whole transition and how do you go, how do you approach it to kind of figure out where they're at in terms of depth? What I do, I listen. I, I listen to everybody, I listen to everybody because I, I work. And you, there will always be a hot spot on the lake. Every year, it could be the North Shore, it could be the Mid Lake, it could be the Nine Woods, right. it could be the river. Now, me, I'm a river guy. 
Uh, I love going to the river. Uh, when when uh, when I could travel that far in a tournament, and you, that's where I would commit to because there's more shallow water. Now, the last all oh, five years, I've committed to fishing shallow on the dam end because there's not that many people that do it. Uh, you see guys back there, you see boats back there fishing. They're going down, they're just fishing the fronts of the docks. Don't let that bother you. You go in there behind them, you fish the whole dock until you find where they're at. And I'll, I commit shallow, uh, like this year, the bass and ball. Yeah. Uh, the very first bass and ball was in yeah. November. Yeah. I probably, my partner and I, Bob, uh, Keith, we probably caught 60 bass that day. Wow. wow. And the shallow, or the deepest one was maybe four feet. Wow. And we had a five, we had big, we had second big bass that Yeah. Day. We had a, a big fish, we got a check. We were in yeah. the top, we were in the top four. And uh, the next, two weekends later, we had the next bass and ball. Yeah. Those fish were gone. And I knew that because I got out the Sunday prior and just kind of idled through those areas and looked, well, the shad was gone. Got to looking, well, so what I did, I sat down in the middle of the cove where we caught all those fish. We caught all those fish out of three, three little pockets. And I sat out there and I got out my notes. I try to keep a notebook in my boat. Nice. And I got out there and I took my notes. And then I got to looking. I seen where the shad were at. Well, they'd moved out to 17 feet. I'll be darned. So I went out the next weekend, me and Bob. We got out and I told him when Bob got in the boat, I said, Bob, we're going to fish a little deeper this time. I said, we're going to throw the same stuff. And Bob is always ready. Yeah. He's a great back boater. Bob had never won a tournament in his life ever as a partner or by himself. So we went out that day and we, we went straight to this one place that I found and it was a boat well in a community dock that had a cable running through the middle of the well. And the cable slammed down to come to the outside. And the shed were set up on that cable so we're the bass. First five casts we made into it, we had our land. Wow. <laughs> and I don't, that one spot. One spot. We pulled in there and we caught, we caught our five. And I told Bob, I said, Bob, now we're, we're going to run. I said, we got to find some big ones. And he said, you, he said, I'm driving. Where are you going? <laughs> and we were in Bob's boat. Bob says, uh, so I told him, I said, let's go over here. I hadn't checked it. We haven't fished it. Let's go look at it. We pull in there. I said, now they were all in seven, exactly 17 feet. I said, idle down the length of this dock. Let's see where 17 feet is. We idled down the length of the dock, found 17 feet. We pulled out and we stopped. We made one cast, we called it 589. Wow. So we did that the rest of the day and we ended up with another five and a half pounder and we won the bass and Bob. Right. And Bob won his first tournament. That's awesome. <laughs> and we had we had an absolute blast. So we you had just gotta pay attention to details. Yeah. You just pay like attention. And they can change. They can change so quick. fast. Yeah. You know, they had been shallow. They've yeah. been right up there in that skinny water. And just a little bit of, and believe it or not, the weather had not changed. The weather was the what, same. What about the Lake level was the same. No the sure. only thing that changed was where the shad went. I'll be darned. And we caught every one of those fish on a uh, half ounce football head jig. I'll be darned. The, the, the first time we caught them on a finesse jig. So what I did the, the second time when we went out, when we were a little deeper, I went ahead and trimmed the jigs to the finesse style. Right. Because that's what they were wanting that fall. Uh, and with a Zoom Z crawl on the back of it. We used brown the first time, black and blue the second time. You know, they, nothing, and weather was basically the exact same. You, wow. you just have to make the change with the fish. Were those deeper fish suspended or were they on the bottom? They were on the bottom. They were as, as where that cable actually hit the bottom. Hmm. The shad were suspended on it. Yeah. But they would follow that bait all the way down to the bottom before they bite. Right. And it was, well, they quit biting on the sixth one because I broke the sixth one off on cable. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as he broke off, it was done. Wow. That's when it was time to leave. Wow. You know that uh, that's the other thing you got to you got to know when to move, and that's where we all make mistakes. I make it worse than anybody's. Sometimes I'll stay too long on a spot. Uh, you uh, you've got to move in the fall. You can't just sit on a place like you can sometimes in the summertime. And I'll like uh, yesterday, I spent five and a half hours in the upper gravel, was uh, just making that big loop. But I I found what I wanted to find. Right. So, but that's that's what practice is. Every time that I fish, is I fish with a purpose. I take my notes. I fish 
for practice for a, a tournament that I might not even have or know now, but those notes tell me that when I have a tournament this time of year, what I might be able to do in that particular area. Uh, you know, I, I don't have the best equipment. I've got an old 10-year-old uh, depth finder, but it does have GPS and I'll mark the spot. It does have a uh, chip in it for a map, which is probably the greatest tool that I've got is that map on that. That map makes all the difference because you can mark on that map. And even knowing the lake, I, I, there's very few places I haven't fished in 40 plus years. I started in 77. But now I know why I caught those fish there. Yeah. All uh, right. You know, that map, the map, you can use it to refresh your memory. You, you can use it as, as the day. You know, I just caught fish off this dock. What's behind that dock? Look at the map. The map will show you where the, where the contours at. That might be the only dock on that row of docks that has the contours so the under, yeah. under it that, that the fish are relating to. So then you can run from dock to dock to dock, yeah. follow that pattern. You, you, pattern fishing is still as relevant today as it was when Roland Martin first coined it back in the 80s. Yeah. Uh, I've still got Roland Martin's 101 Bass Fishing Secrets and I still go back to it. <laughs> that book is older than dirt <laughs> and some of the stuff in there still is relevant. Oh, well, all of it is still relevant yeah. today. It never goes away. Yeah. Uh, we can see all the technology, embrace it, use what you can, use what, you, what you've got, but also remember the old stuff that's still there. Harold, uh, we're just about out of time. I mean, when I say out of time, we could, I, I could listen to you, and I'm sure the Bass and Bob members <laughs> could listen to you for another hour, but we don't want to take up all your time. But So on the, the Bass and Bob members, uh, there's many of them, just like me, that I'll call average fishermen, just getting started fishermen, fish, weekend anglers, fish here, you know, maybe a few times a year, or, you know, whatever. Um, if they were, if, 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 any recommendations for them as it relates to whether they're practicing for maybe that charity tournament that they fish every year or just coming down there coming down with some buddies a few times a year and they're in a cove somewhere blah 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 anywhere around the lake uh, any recommendations you would have for them in terms of just going out and getting some bites always make it fun if you're going to get bites now there, there's no question about it top water is the funnest thing there is if, they, if I could only have three lures in my boat, and I can guarantee you, you'll get a bite sometime during the day on those three lures. I'd have a buzz bait. Uh, I throw a buzz bait until the ice is over. Uh, a Cinco and, and a jig. Cool. You will always get a bite on those three lures. I don't, I, they're, and you know the other thing is, these are, these are baits that, that they don't cost you a ton of money. Uh, you can go out and have fun. If you lose one, you lose it. You go get you another one. They're not that expensive. Right. Don't don't fret don't fret the hard stuff. Throw that bait out there and have fun with it. Think about you know, and they'll they'll bite it on Lake of the Ozarks. You know, any of the Ozark lakes, those three lures are going to get you a bite. Got it. Uh, I don't. I I probably would. If if you know, if those were the only three I could have, that'd be it. Uh, Cinco, you can throw your ramp. They'll bite it even in even. I've grabbed a sinkhole off the ice <laughs> and caught fish. Uh, a couple years ago in a bass and bob tournament, yeah. I threw a jig up on an ice flute, pulled it off the ice flute and caught it. Me and Bob, that was the first tournament me and Bob ever fished together. Uh, bob Keith. Yeah. Great guy. And we went in the back of the lick branch and the back of it was froze over. And there's a creek channel that runs out in the middle of it that few people ever recognize. I throwed it up on the throwed up on the ice shelf, pulled the jig off of it, and it fell down to the bottom, and it felt like a leaf. Wow! And that was a that was a six uh, it weighed six twelve or six thirteen something like that. <laughs> That's awesome. But you got uh, you just uh, always make it fun. Yeah. Don't let the conditions or people people are our own worst enemy. Oh, they ain't biting. You know, they ain't doing this, or the water's turning over. Ah, oh, blah 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 blah. <laughs> Go out and have fun. Yeah. Go out. Uh, Go out and do what you like to do, and and make and it'll work. Uh, never give up. Yeah. You, just, you just can't give up. Go out and, and get with it. Love it. Good deal. Any, uh, Harold, that's great in, in information. Any further questions? I just kind of went when you're term, if you are tournament fishing, do you mainly use your horizontals just to find them, and do you go back to the jig and say, go when you're in the tournament, or do you it, use it, combination? I'll tell you what, it depends. It, it really does. I, uh, once, once the tournament starts, I generally pare down. 
I'll have the two main productive horizontal lures on one side, and then I'll have three jigs or three drop baits on the other side. Mm -hmm. And I let the conditions for the day dictate what I'm going to do. Fish uh, how active they are that day, and what kind of cover I'm fishing. Uh, if I'm having to cover a lot of water to get bites, it's going to be horizontal. Uh, if, if, if I can pull up on us, if I've got a pattern set where it's a certain dock with a certain uh, contour underneath it, it's almost always uh, vertical. Uh, and then, you know, it, it, then it will depend on the speed or rate of the fall of the jig or the worm that I'm throwing. Uh, that, makes, that makes all the difference in the world. I, if I'm not getting bites, I'm almost, I'm almost always going to reach for something horizontal and cover some water. Uh, once, once I determine I can't get a bite that way, then that's when I pick up that Senko and I'll put everything else up. I'll pick that Senko up and, and just go fishing and get some tournament, get some points. Uh, you know, all right? You know, a lot of sometimes you'll win. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you'll get out there and uh, that Senko will catch that pair of five pounders and, and a limit. And uh, you know, that's what you do. Cool. Perfect. <laughs> Great question. There we go. There. John? Good. Uh, Harold, any any sponsors or did, I, I have you had my, have you had any mentors or anybody that uh, that's you know, the one us thing I would about. like to do. I would like to thank uh, I'd like to thank everybody that I've ever fished with. I have absolutely learned something from everybody. John over here fished with me back when I had a John boat back in the in the early eighties. Him and a guy by the name of Shorty Cornett. Shorty's gone now. Almost all my mentors are gone. <laughs> Bless their hearts. I had uh, Denzel Pappy Sloan. Uh, taught me a lot when I was 16. He was one of the studs on Larry Hills. Uh, Y'all have heard of Tom Barrington, uh, Dave Miller. He was their uncle. Uh, he, taught, he taught them, taught a lot of us on how to fish and how to be good angler, how to, how to not. Denzel would have a, a reel, he, he'd make a cast and it'd whine, and then you'd hear gravel as he cranked it back in. <laughs> but the man could catch fish and he knew, he knew how to be a tournament angler, he knew how to win. There's good anglers and then there's winners. And I'm gonna tell you, sometimes there's a difference. Uh, some guys might not be a very good angler but they know how to win. Uh, some guys are great anglers and just have a little bad luck and never win. So you gotta determine, go out there and be the best you can and, and it'll all happen. Uh, Bruce Geyer up in Eldon, I worked for him, his family for 10 years. Bruce taught me a lot. The rascal never showed me how to jerk bait. <laughs> I've always been mad at him about that. <laughs> but uh, he, he, great angler, uh, good guy. He knows a lot of stuff. Still to this day, he'll give me pointers. He'll see me pull in. He has to come out, give me a few pointers here and there. He's a great guy. Uh, all the people I fished with, I fished the Red Man Tournament Trail for 10 years. A guy by the name of Mike Roller down in, in Southern Missouri. He's one of the guys who, with Basil Bacon, invented the four blade prop. He taught me how to Carolina Reef. Everybody, everything that I learned, well, not everything. Some things we, we do we learn on our own, but you've got to have somebody teach you how to learn. And I've had some great teachers. Uh, the Red Man Tournament Trail BFL today, uh, you know, they, they have co anglers. Back in the day, we were flipping each other for boats, and we'd have wrestling matches on the park <laughs> trying to figure out whose boat was going to take. I always learned from every one of those guys. And they were, they were great anglers. Uh, the old Little Zark Division, Plains Division, won a few of those tournaments. We had a good time. Uh, won a BFL on Bull Shoals 2001. That was a great learning experience. Jim Eakins was second. His son was third. <laughs> you know, we, uh, it was all a great time, and everybody helped each other, and we all learned. And that's what I hope happens today. I don't fish as many tournaments today with a lot of people because I, the, club, the club stuff keeps me occupied. Uh, one of these days we'll get back at it. That's the whole deal. Fish with as many different people as you can. Uh, don't fish just draw or club tournaments or buddy tournaments. Fish and draw tournaments. Draw some different people. Take if you get a chance to fish with somebody, do so. I had some I've regretted. They, the guys I've always wanted to fish with, tried to fish with, they passed away. Uh, you, you're going to learn something every time. I promise you. Uh, pay attention and have fun. You always learn. Great. Appreciate it, Harold. You are awesome. Thank you.